emergencies than any other country. However, the 911 terror attack and Hurricane Katrina demonstrated the consequences of inadequate planning and preparation. These events have also taught us that while national planning is required, it is the state and local public health departments, safety professionals, and first respondents who are the most critical to get help to those in immediate need. Today's hearing will look at ability of states and local communities to maintain an appropriate level of readiness to respond to a pandemic flu and how federal authorities can assist them in mounting a sustained and effective response to a pandemic striking the United States. Unlike a typical natural disaster such as a hurricane or a wildfire, outbreaks of pandemic flu affects all regions of the country virtually at the same time, making regional cooperation impossible. Also with the pandemic, it is necessary for public health teams to function 24-7 in a three-shift pattern for a period of several months. These public health workers must con conduct surveillances, lab tests, and treatments while coordinating school closings, surges at hospitals, and the storage and distribution of treatments and vaccines. Shifting national priorities and the impact of the current economic downturn have led to budget cuts in health departments across the country. According to the National Association of Counties and City Health Officials, 53% of local health departments in the state of New York lost staff in 2008, and 40% expect to make more layoffs this year. While dealing with budget and workforce challenges, New York has become a focal point of the current H1N1 uh, outbreak. Nationally, the public health workforce has been recently reduced by over 7,000 workers with more reductions expected. Over 85% of local health departments reduced their staff in 2008, and 46% are expected to lay off more workers in 2009. A recent and seemingly prophetic GAO report published on February 26, 2009 warns of the continued threat of a pandemic as our national priorities move from pandemic preparedness to the economy and other issues. Current events remind us that pandemics can strike at any time and with little warning. Our communities need to stay ready to respond to such a threat. I'm hopeful that this hearing will shed light on exactly how prepared we are to respond to a pandemic at the state and local level. I'm also hopeful that our witnesses will help us discover what we, will all, what we all can do, not just the federal government to make sure our communities are ready to handle what Mother Nature dishes out. I want to thank all of our witnesses for appearing here today, and I would look forward to your testimony as well. At this time, I would like to yield to the ranking member from California, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this important uh, hearing on state and local pandemic pre preparedness. I also want to thank our witnesses for taking time out of their busy schedule to testify before the committee. We recognize in order to prepare for a hearing like this, it isn't just the work of those who will prepare, but in fact of some of the most important people in our response, uh, local and state response uh, units. In the event of an outbreak of pandemic flu, a coordinated response between the federal, state, and local authorities from the Department of Homeland Security, Health and Human Services, to public health departments, hospitals, and emergency response teams in the smallest of American towns will be key to ensure the health and safety of all Americans. The question of, of whether there will be an outbreak of pandemic flu somewhere in the world of a proportion similar to that of the early 1900s is not an if, but a when. To, to address uh, threats from SARS, avian, uh, avian uh, influenza, inf influenza, I'm sorry, you can tell I'm not a doctor, the Bush administration created the National Strategy for Pandemic Influenza in 2005, a comprehensive approach to, uh, for preparing for detecting and responding to a potential pandemic. 
The strategy established guidance for federal, state, and local preparedness and response. Additionally, since 2002, over $9 billion in grants has gone out to the states to strengthen hospital and public health preparedness. This coordinated response strategy is <clears throat> in the midst of having its first test, the outbreak of the H1N1, or swine flu. As comprehensive as our plans at the federal level might be, absent pro proper coordination with state and local governments, any type of emergency response will be lacking. Less than two months before the H1N1 outbreak first appeared, the GAO reported <clears throat> that more could be done to facilitate coordination between federal, state, and local governments and the private sector to prepare for a pandemic. <clears throat> Questions also remain about the adequacy of the strategic national stockpile, <clears throat> excuse me, and how assets such as antiviral and respirators, <clears throat> excuse me, in the stockpile are distributed to the states during an emergency. Today we have an opportunity to learn more about the gaps that may exist and what we can do to address them should an epidemic worsen, should this epidemic worsen, or before any health emergency. Additionally, it's clear that we now have a number of, of financial problems at the federal, state, and local level. It is inevitable that without a uh, immediate requirement for pandemic flu preparation, that states and localities would begin trying to divert funds to other areas. This could be done at perhaps the worst possible time. Even as we speak, the national stockpiles in some areas are being uh, depleted simply because they have reached their expiration. Only a week ago, I had individuals involved in our anthrax preparedness in my office showing me a table of the expiration of anthrax and in fact that this material is being destroyed. A small amount of it is going to our troops in Iraq and we're thankful for that, but the majority of it in all likelihood will not be used unless uh, health officials begin to find either ways to certify a longer time before expiration or they're dispersed to uh, first responders who could, in fact, take advantage today of preparation uh, for a possible anthrax outbreak. This and many other areas are of importance to this committee because although there has been good work done in 11 to help America be the best it can be in the case of any kind of an emergency, including a man-made one, budget cuts at the federal, state, and local level are in fact of great concern to us. We have to know, will we maintain our preparedness and even improve it, and particularly our coordination, or are we saving pennies now to not be able to save lives later? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing, and I yield back. Thank you very much for your statement. Uh, I yield five minutes to the gentleman from Rhode Island, Patrick Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, all of you. <clears throat> um, I'd like to get into the response to a potential pandemic um, and the <clears throat> necessity to um, address the psychological response. Uh, obviously, back in the uh, 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, there was that civil preparedness. Everybody got under the desk. Everyone had a bomb out shelter. There was a sense that we needed to get uh, people prepared in the event of a, a, you know, war, World War III. Um, one thing that it did for people is it gave them a sense that they had some sense of um, control over their situation. Um, in light of these announcements from 24-hour barrage from the media, um, a lot of people get anxious and nervous because they don't know what they're supposed to do. Um, do you not think that it's an necessary for us to, to, you know, even in the light of now that we have terrorism, pre have people prepared in this country to have a plan of action in advance um, at their workplace, um, at their school, at, you know, when they're traveling to work, 
um, when they're at home, um, whatever the situation may be, as to what the, um, how to, what to do things are that they need to follow in order to respond to uh, a given scenario. And isn't it important that they, f they practice that scenario um, and that we as a society encourage that kind of civil preparedness so that there isn't a, a mass, you know, you know, kind of deluge of people to the emergency rooms in this country, um, which is exactly the opposite of what you want in a kind of situation like this. And would you all comment on that? W would the gentleman yield? Uh, we have not sworn them in yet. So uh, hold the question. You know, you have so you, you made a note, you know, so, you know, and then after I swear them in, then they give an answer. All right? Yeah. <laughs> Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Quayler. Chairman, I, I have some questions, but I'll reserve it so we can get started with the testimony. Thank you. Gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster. Thank the Chairman for having this, and I yield back. Right. Thank you very much. Now, will you please stand? I swear you in. So you can get them Patrick's question. <laughs> you better tell the truth and nothing but the truth. If so, answer in the affirmative. Let the record reflect that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. We may be seated. Why don't we just go right down the line, starting with you, Dr. Sasson, and just come right uh, down the line. Yeah. Thank you, and good afternoon, Mr. Ch uh, Chairman, Towns, Ranking Member Issa, and distinguished members of the committee. I'm uh, Dan Sawson, Acting Director of the Coordinating Office for Terrorism Preparedness and Emergency Response from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the importance of state and local public health preparedness and response efforts and how we can further our response to public health emergencies in the United States. Our nation's current response to the 2009 novel H1N1 influenza is a direct result of the investments and support from the Congress for state and local public health preparedness and the hard work of federal, state, and local public health officials across the country. This outbreak has placed huge demands on state and local public health departments to rapidly expand on-the-ground investigations and response activities and highlighted how necessary it is to have a trained workforce at the ready. State and local public health departments are first responders to a wide variety of health threats, many of which never make the evening news. The many duties of public health departments include tracking the source, spread, and severity of health threats, educating the public on how to safeguard their health, delivering medicines, guidance, and community interventions to lessen disease. Public health departments must have flexible and scalable capacity to respond to all hazards, both major events such as influenza pandemics and terrorist attacks, also uh, to more routine events including community outbreaks of infectious diseases, chemical spills, and natural disasters. The primary federal support for emergency preparedness and response at the state and local public health department level is CDC's Public Health Emergency Preparedness Cooperative Agreement. This cooperative agreement provides funding and scientific expertise in areas such as surveillance and health monitoring, epidemiology, laboratory testing, countermeasure delivery, incident management, and emergency communications. In addition, public health departments received supplemental funding for pandemic influenza preparedness from 2006 to 2008 to support practical, community-based approaches to prevent or delay the spread of an influenza pandemic. Activities related to this supplemental funding include planning, community summits to facilitate engagement across government agencies, business, and nonprofit organizations, and exercises to test response capabilities, such as providing antiviral drugs and vaccinating broad segments of the community. These efforts paid off. During the response to 2009 H1N1 influenza, public health departments at the state and local levels have been working around the clock. Emergency operations centers have been activated and emergency plans put into place across the country. Public health officials started tracking possible cases of H1N1 influenza, tested a large number of specimens, sp samples for the presence of the virus, provided information to communities about how to slow the spread of the virus, and educated the public about precautionary measures they could take. This education worked. 
a national survey conducted by the Harvard School of Public Health earlier this month found that two-thirds of respondents report that they or someone in their household washed their hands or used hand sanitizer more frequently in response to reports about H1N1 flu. And over half say that they made preparations to stay at home if they or a family member became sick. Despite the great strides in preparedness and response for pandemic influenza, work remains to be done. More can be done to bolster the public health workforce, which is the foundation of effective preparedness and response. Ongoing shortages exist in key occupations such as epidemiology, laboratory science, and public health nursing. It is also a challenge to have enough public health workers at the ready to deliver medicines and medical supplies during an emergency. The nation's systems for tracking disease can also be improved. For example, we do not have nationwide electronic systems to automatically manage and share data, such as laboratory results that are vital for response efforts. The path of the 2009 H1N1 outbreak may change. We need to be prepared for possible resurgence of this virus in the fall, potentially, potentially in a more virulent form. Complicating matters, other public health incidents that need our attention continue to arise. Foodborne disease outbreaks, floods, wildfires, and soon the hurricane season will be here. We must remain vigilant throughout this and subsequent outbreaks. At no time in our nation's history have we been more prepared to face this kind of challenge. Nevertheless, we, more work remains to be done. We look forward to working closely with you to continue to prepare the nation for evolving health threats. Thank you for the honor to speak before you today. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sasson. Uh, Dr. Burkhead, let me just uh, say a few words about you. As the Deputy Commissioner of Public Health for the State of New York, and is an associate professor of epidemiology at the University at Albany School of Public Health, Dr. Burkhead. Thanks very much, Chairman Towns, uh, Congre Congressman Issa, and distinguished committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. The events of the last month with the dramatic emergence of the H1N1 swine influenza and the equally rapid public health response have proven the value of the investment we have made as a nation in health emergency preparedness planning in recent years. In a short time, we have learned a lot about H1N1, but we still have a lot to learn. Uh, last week, it appeared that things were getting back to normal, but the virus has continued to circulate in many communities, and a number of schools, as the chairman noted, have been closed in New York City this week due to high rates of absenteeism from H1N1. My testimony today, I'll provide a little background about New York's response and address the committee's questions. On April 25th, the New York Governor David Patterson directed the State Health Department to activate its emergency preparedness plan in response to the H1N1 cases in New York State. This plan was developed over a number of years of pandemic planning and involves the collaboration of programs across the Health Department, other state uh, governmental agencies, and local public health departments, including the New York City uh, Department of Health. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the committee's question on the need for resources and the impact of the economic downturn, two federal fund sources have played a critical role to the state in developing its current preparedness. The CDC Public Health Preparedness Cooperative Agreement, which Dr. Sasson mentioned, and the DHHS Hospital Preparedness Cooperative Agreement. These, these funds, I would point out, have been reduced by 40 percent and 24 percent, respectively, in the last five years. Uh, in addition, the state did receive pandemic influenza supplemental funds, as Dr. Sawson noted, from 2005 to 2008, but those funds have now also ceased. Uh, New York City also receives this uh, same direct funding. Uh, New York State has provided $60 million in the state budget to support state preparedness programming. Uh, these funds have been used to purchase supplies and medications for the state's emergency stockpile, uh, including the supply for New York City. Uh, we have purchased the maximum number of antiviral treatment courses allowed under the federal program and now have 3.1 million treatment courses of antivirals on hand. Uh, we also have purchased other supplies such as 1,700 ventilators for patients with respiratory failure during a pandemic. New York has made it a priority to fund local health departments, which are key to the local response, the boots on the ground, if you will, for local response. We've provided $96 million in state and federal funds over the last seven years to our local health departments. Funding to locals was viewed as so important that the state health department absorbed the entire cut in the CDC preparedness grant in recent years in order to keep the county funding whole. However, due to the current fiscal crisis, county funding finally was reduced by almost 40 percent for the remainder of the current 
contract cycle. Ironically, uh, this occurred on April 1st, just before the H1N1 hit. Many local health departments had to lay off preparedness staff at that point. In this context, the current discussion of the additional $350 million in one-time federal funding to state health departments and locals to deal with H1N1 is welcome news, uh, although the, the exact number should be examined uh, to be sure it's enough when we're clear on what we're being asked to do with it. Uh, such funding will be critical for states to maintain and strengthen their public health response capabilities in the face of what will likely be an ongoing threat. In particular, state and local health departments are likely to play a key role in any mass vaccination efforts should an H1N1 influenza vaccine be made. Such a vaccination program would be unprecedented in scope and give, given the size of the population to be vaccinated. Federal funds will be critical to these efforts, uh, but it is also critical for Congress to look to restoration of the cuts I mentioned in the base public health and health uh, hospital preparedness programs, respectively, that states have sustained over the last five years. One-time funding cannot provide for ongoing infrastructure needed to address H1N1 and future public health emergencies. Um, in conclusion, some have suggested, suggested that public health may have overreacted to these events because a severe pandemic has not yet materialized. I want to assure you that at each step of the way, prudent steps were taken to prepare and protect the population in, face, in the face of uncertainty about the virus. State health department scientists who have spent their careers working on influenza have commented to me that this H1N1 virus represents the biggest shift in influenza viruses in their professional lifetimes. While initial guidance, for example, to close schools following a single case may seem in retrospect to have been overkill, I would make the analogy to hurricane preparedness. When a hurricane is bearing down on you, you don't take the view that we can relax because it might veer off. You have to assume the worst and prepare for it. That is what the public health community has done in the past month with H1N1 influenza. We are much better prepared than we were even a few years ago. However, there are gaps in health preparedness infrastructure that can only be addressed by stable base funding to maintain that infrastructure. I urge Congress to consider restoring those funds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Burkhead. Dr. Rex Archer is the Director of Health for Kansas City, Missouri, and is a past president of the National Association of City and County Health Officials. Welcome, Dr. Archer. Good afternoon. Are you want to turn your mic on and then pull a little closer? That always to you? helps. Good afternoon. Um, protecting and serving a population of 475,000 uh, in Kansas City, Missouri, is a challenge. Uh, we have a 143-year history and tradition of protecting against contagious and communicable diseases. Approximately 10 years ago in the spring of 99, uh, I started asking where were we as a nation at the local public health department level in preparing for bioterrorism or various emerging infectious disease threats. As often happens when you ask those questions, they put you as chair of a committee. Um, and so we've had a committee in NACHO for 10 years that have been working on these issues. We've made a lot of progress, but the old saying, uh, harder, the only thing harder than preparing for a disaster is answering the question of why you didn't. And so with that, um, I believe that our charge in looking at how we may need to reform some aspects of public health, um, actually we can borrow a model from uh, fire departments. If you think about a fire and influenza, fire burns through buildings, influenza burns through people. Uh, fire departments um, don't respond with the minimum they need to put out a fire. Uh, they come in with extra trucks in our urban areas to put out that fire because you don't want to chase a fire. Um, they have surge capacity to respond to those types of events. 99% of the time there aren't fires going on in our urban fire departments, um, but 99% of the time our local health departments are being challenged with covering all their mandates right now, so we don't have that surge capacity that we need to be able to respond. As an example, I really believe that um, if I think about our health department and where we were back in 1999, we were less than 5 percent prepared to manage a Category 3 uh, pandemic uh, from influenza. Uh, we've made tremendous progress, uh, but I think we peaked back in about 2006. Uh, that in a sense we have a perfect storm going on with federal, state, and local funds being cut 
Uh, we don't have the people there to maintain our plans that were developed. Uh, the pandemic flu uh, funding was critical for us to develop relationships with our churches, with our faith community um, in general, with our schools, uh, with our business community. Uh, but this exercise that we've been going through recently with this uh, H1N1 um, has really pointed out that the things that we put in place a few years ago, those communities are now asking us to respond, but the people aren't there anymore because the funding went away. As an example, I've got 186 staff for serving that almost half million people, uh, but only 20 of them are really available for this kind of event. They're either funded out of grants, and that's an issue I think we need to look at. We could change the federal uh, guidance so that people under grants are expected to be cross-trained and prepared for these kinds of issues, um, whatever the funding source coming down, that we would have them and be able to deploy them in these kinds of incidents. Um, we basically, if we'd had to go any longer with this event, we were at the point and had prepared to stop and reduce our number of restaurant inspections to stop some of our contact tracing for sexually transmitted diseases because we were running our staff at 12, 14 hours a day, half that time even over the weekend. Um, and that was all really voluntary because uh, we don't pay them overtime, so it really makes it uh, very difficult to, to manage. Our response, though, was extremely effective. We activated uh, CDC, was very helpful in communicating with us. The National Public Health Inf um, Information Coalition was useful. Um, the things that we had were in place. Uh, my fear is, though, that we are losing ground. And if I had to really sum up, um, I want to thank uh, the other local health departments, the state health departments, CDC, for all of its work. Uh, but we really need the staff to keep the relationships. When you develop relationships with school systems, with faith community, with businesses, uh, but then those people go away, uh, the plan can be there on the shelf, but you can't exercise the plan in an emergency. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to yield to the gentleman from Ohio, to uh, Mr. Kucinich, to introduce the next witness. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Terry Allen. Uh, Mr. Allen is the Health Commissioner for Cuyahoga County, uh, in which my constituency in the 10th District is included. Uh, he is the uh, Commissioner for the Cuyahoga County Board of Health. And the Cuyahoga County Board of Health serves, uh, is the local public health authority for over 886,000 citizens in 57 greater Cleveland communities. So he has a lot of responsibilities. Mr. Allen is also president-elect of the Association of Ohio Health Commissioners and the former regional coordinator for public health preparedness in the Northeast region of Ohio. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to have you here, uh, Mr. Allen, for your testimony to our committee. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much, and uh, we yield in five minutes. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Issa, and Congressman Kucinich, thank you for the um, introduction and members of the committee. We appreciate the, uh, the time to talk to you today, and I want to give you my perspective from Greater Cleveland on uh, uh, what we know and what we still need to do and our experience uh, over the last several weeks. The H1N1 response really has been a live exercise uh, of our uh, testing our capabilities and illuminating our gaps and challenges that we still have ahead of us. As we really prepare for what is to come, uh, the unknowns for the coming flu season this fall. Funding cuts have been mentioned. Uh, close to 40 percent have affected Ohio as well in local health departments. And certainly as we look at the state and, and uh, local funding challenges that everyone is facing, we expect those uh, further cuts to be on the horizon, which is very concerning to us just as we uh, acknowledge our capabilities, which I'll talk a little bit about, but also illuminate our, our challenges. In Greater Cleveland, we've been working hard uh, for many years working with our partners uh, throughout the region. Uh, on our 24-7 response capability, our comprehensive planning, establishing strong relationships with the first responder community, regional cooperation and mutual aid to assist across that five-county region that Congressman Kucinich mentioned, our ability to uh, determine the distribution and, and uh, determinants of disease, our epidemiology capacity, 
the ability to communicate with the public, which was very critical so that they had a trusted communication point during this event, and working knowledge of incident command structure that police and fire have been working with for many years. In terms of our gaps, we still have a lot of work to do around volunteer recruitment, training, and retention. Right now, in the greater Cleveland area, we have about 5,000 volunteers, and we need closer to 8,500. In our five-county region, we need about 15,000 volunteers that need to be trained, they need to be oriented, and they need to be uh, 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 made uh, available uh, very quickly to assist us if we need to ramp up. Our regional distribution of antivirals, which very much came to, uh, came to a point here in recent weeks to distribute those to our community partners, to hospitals, uh, to uh, perhaps the indigent and folks that have nowhere else to receive these services are critical. Alternate care site planning uh, when hospitals are full, surge capacity uh, in terms of staffing that Dr. Archer mentioned, social distancing plans. We may need to be telling folks uh, if things were to get very severe uh, in the worst of circumstances to stay home from school, to stay home from work, to telecommute. To uh, then the, the kids would then need to stay away from the mall so we're not in a position of, of uh, uh, passing the virus around. Uh, vulnerable populations, the poor and disabled, are particularly at risk. And local surveillance capacity to be able to identify early on when an outbreak may hit your community. In my view, public health is an essential partner and must be viewed as part of the national defense system. Acquiring stable and adequate funding for public health is absolutely critical if we're going to be available and reliable for the public uh, in a way that they have a right to expect. Because of the budget cuts, we're particularly concerned and, and hopeful at the same time uh, about the $350 million that was talked about in supplemental money that the House was gracious enough to, to put into the budget, and we're hopeful that that'll be part of the conference discussion. In terms of personal preparedness that Congressman Kennedy spoke of, uh, We've suffered nationally, we believe, from pan flu paralysis, with the general public becoming fatigued from our calls to have an emergency plan for your community. Our H1N1 response is an opportunity to develop a culture of preparedness. Folks are paying attention right now, so every family knows what to do. We need resources now, since as of August 2009, our pandemic flu funding will be zeroed out. So it's our hope that we learn uh, or have the opportunity uh, to continue these efforts. And it really is about people. It's people on the ground that are there to respond day in and day out uh, to assure um, the public uh, and to, uh, to limit the scope and magnitude of an outbreak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Paul Jarris is a family physician currently serving as the executive director of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. He is also the former commissioner of health for the state of Vermont. Uh, doctor, you have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank uh, Ranking Member Isa and other congressmen uh, for this opportunity to speak before you. Um, I have submitted and written testimony to you, but rather than repeating some of what's been said before, I think I'll try to emphasize some points um, as the last Your in entire statement will be, will be included in the record. Thank you. Um, a couple of points that I think are worth stressing. Um, as much as we'd like to believe this episode is over, this episode is not over in the United States. We still face a novel influenza that is spreading rapidly in this country. It is in 48 states and as well as the District of Columbia. We have confirmed with laboratory 5,700 uh, ill individuals, but there's probably more along the order of 100,000 Americans who have been made ill so far. And we frequently hear the comment that this is just like another seasonal influenza. It simply is not. The average age of the ill individual with this outbreak right now is 19. The average age of an individual in intensive care unit with this illness is 23. That is not a seasonal influenza. Seasonal influenzas also do not occur this time of year. So this is a novel and new virus, and we simply do not understand it yet. We do not know what is going to happen in the fall, and I would argue that if we're lucky, this will come back in the fall um, if it goes away in the summer at the same level of virulence. But it would not be responsible for us to, to not keep history in mind and recognize that in 1918, that second wave was far more severe. In 1957, in Japan, it, uh, the, the influenza came back with a second wave that was much more severe. So history would mandate that we are prepared in the fall for what comes at us. 
Um, I do believe that we can be very proud, and your committee can be very proud of the performance of the government. And, and Dr. Sossen, Captain Sossen, and, and Dr. Besser, and all of Health and Human Services in the federal government should be commended on the way this was organized so that the federal government, state government, and local governments came together as a single public health entity to respond to the American people. The Harvard survey is testament to that. When 80% of the public uh, reports that they are satisfied with a governmental response and 88% uh, say that um, that they are satisfied with the information they've gotten, I think we all wish we could go home. It's not going to get any better than that. But we still have many challenges and face to face. Now, we did, based on the uh, investments Congress made, uh, plan and exercise these plans over the past number of years. Um, and our response to date has been quite good. Um, as we all know, plans do not survive the first contact, and many assumptions in our plans were incorrect. We assumed that this virus would start overseas. We would have a month to two months to figure out how transmissible this virus was and how severe it was. Well, it didn't. It began in North America, so we had to activate plans without really understanding the virus and how transmissible and how severe it was. We don't fully understand that right now. But we were able to adopt and modify what we were doing and I think provide a very good response. As you've heard the other um, witnesses testify, there's a big difference between a three-week response, which we've just gone through, and a full epidemic or pandemic response, which may be six months or more. We simply cannot sustain the level of response we have had in this nation to date. Um, as was mentioned, we do not have the workforce. We don't have the depth on the bench. It is only humanly possible to work two to three shifts for so long with a workforce that has been cut by 11,000 in the past year and likely will be cut by 11,000 more at the local and state level. It is not humanly possible to maintain this response, and that is why we need your help. We, as I mentioned before, we have seen significant cuts in state and local preparedness funding that comes through the CDC. Uh, we have seen significant cuts in the hospital preparedness money, which comes out of uh, ASPR and HHS. And in addition, we have had no pandemic pan planning funding at the state and local level since August of 08. So what you're seeing is a response, but there's no fuel in the tank. And we're asking you, please, to assist the states and the locals to mount a response for what may come at us in the fall. Very quickly, I'll give you one example of what we have to prepare for. It, it, we are likely to develop a pandemic influenza vaccine, this novel H1N1 vaccine for the fall. It likely will require two doses. That is 600 million vaccinations we may have to give in the fall on top of the usual 80 to 100 million doses we do, we give um, for seasonal influenza. So we are talking about potentially 700 million vaccinations to give in the fall with a workforce that is diminished. The complexity of that, not only the cost of it, but the complexity of administering that to Americans in a timely fashion is tremendous. The vaccine will roll off the production line at 15 to 20,000 doses a week. It will be distributed by the federal government to the states on a per capita basis. So it will be dribbling in over a number of months, and we have to go down a priority list to protect the, um, the first responders, the health care providers, and others. So as one example, that is the level of complexity we face, and that is the need we need resources for the fall. And I'd be happy to answer questions. I apologize for going over time. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, just thank all of you for your, your testimony. Um, let me just say um, uh, uh, that that is sort of frightening. You know, when you think about it in terms of, uh, and then you're saying that um, that you're losing staff. I mean, it seemed to me that you should be adding staff. I mean, that's the, at this time. Uh, Dr. Burkhead and Dr. Archer and, and Mr. Allen, your states have created a preparedness plan and you submitted it to CDC. Are your states currently able to carry out those plans as submitted? I mean, you, Dr. Burkhead. Yes, I think, uh, uh, as Dr. Jarris said, we have been carrying them out for the last three weeks, and it's, it's fortunate that we had gone through that planning process. We've actually implemented the plans that we, we developed. Uh, but I think the point is that uh, how long it's sustainable. We, we at the state level have had to pull staff uh, from many different areas of the health department off of their regular duties. Uh, for a couple of weeks there, we were working seven days a week, uh, you know, 18-hour shifts, uh, and it, the sustainability of that uh, is uh, hard to imagine for much longer. And then it, adding on to that, 
uh, the vaccination program, which may come about this fall, uh, I think there's a, there's a, a huge need. So we're, we're able to maintain what's happened so far, but uh, I think, as Dr. Jarris aptly said, the, the, the tank is empty at this point, so we need to, we need to refuel. All right. Dr. Archer, thank you. Dr. Burkhead. In 2006, we were better able to. Uh, we had uh, more staffing um, and had funding for some of the relationships on the plan. It, it's one thing to say you're going to interact with your business community because of these social distancing and other issues, and we had done training. It's another thing then to support that um, if you don't have the people there anymore. So um, I would say that uh, I'm afraid that many local health departments across the country um, have lost ground the last few years and that, um, uh, yes, we can do almost anything for two or three weeks, um, but um, we got to the point of exhaustion um, just during this incident. Yes, okay, Doc. Um, Mr. Mr. Allen. Chairman. Uh, I think that uh, we know what to do. Uh, it, uh, to reiterate what's just been said, we just don't have the horses to do it over an extended period of time. If we had a higher severity situation where we had a lot more cases, more severe disease, more contact tracing, um, uh, dealing with a lot more fear, which was already substantial even in this circumstance, compounded by the confluence of things that Dr. Burke had mentioned around a fall vaccination campaign, uh, we're going to be severely strapped. We won't be able to do it. Right. You know, it's not good. I mean, it's not really making a lot of sense to have a plan if you can't implement it, does it? Well, just to think about regular seasonal influenza. We can't vaccinate one-third of our population in a regular year when we have a year to prepare and plan for it. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Are you asking for money? You know, uh, because quite often people will need it and won't ask for it. Are you asking for money? Additional money. Well, in my testimony, I asked for two things. I supported the the the, the idea of one time the 350 million. That's going to be desperately needed if we are going to vaccinate this fall. But I also asked for restoration of the cuts that have occurred in the CDC and and HHS uh, hospital pr uh, funding programs over the last five years. That's that's partly why uh, we're at reduced uh, levels at this point. Mm -hmm. Dr. Archer. Sometimes public health is not very good at asking for funds. Um, we try to do That's what we can, and you're correct. Uh, um, we made a mistake, I believe, uh, when we asked originally after 9-11 and the anthrax attacks for just uh, under a billion dollars that um, the country deserves a level of protection much more than that and to truly have the infrastructure to not only protecting against these things, but also um, when our health care costs are going out of, out of sight, uh, our population in this country is down in the 30, 40 nations are above us in regards to life expectancy because we're not investing in prevention. And so if we put the systems in place to truly work with our communities to prevent illness on a day-to-day -day basis that we should be investing, we could also turn that structure in these kinds of emergencies and we'd have those relationships. So I, I actually would go out on a limb and say we need five to ten times what we're currently getting um, to really uh, make a big difference in the population's health. Mr. Allen, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think that, uh, as Dr. Archer said, public health isn't very good at asking. Often we just we're out there trying to help uh, the least among us, and certainly I'm concerned about these vulnerable populations, the disabled, uh, the poor that are most susceptible often to disease. And I think that uh, we, we, the stability of funding is important. We see sort of a seesaw effect, and it's difficult to maintain staff to do whatever it is that needs to be done. It's not really about building widgets or counting widgets, as has been said. Uh, it's about staff to be in place to surge, to respond uh, during these events, there's lots of work in public health to do, but to be able to put all hands on deck for this response is critical, and right now the resources aren't there, particularly for the least uh, folks able to fight off disease. Yeah. Thank you very much. I yield to the ranking member, Congressman Isaac from California. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, Dr. Jarris, uh, I didn't intend to ask this question, but I just want to follow up on something you said in your opening statement. Uh, you said 15,000 units a week. 
uh, in 52, I'm sorry, I mean, no, 150,000 units a week. Uh, and I'm just trying to do the math. That doesn't get you to 300 million in a year. Okay. And yeah. there's no, I'm assuming that whatever you can't make in the one year, you're not going to make the other. So there's no plan based on that volume to achieve uh, 600 million doses, right? Um, if I misspoke, I apologize. What, what, um, initially, there will likely be a bolus that comes off of vaccine that's been produced. We're not quite sure how large that will be. After that, 15 to 20 million doses a uh, week should be coming out and being distributed. So if we take the 600 million. 15 million. Yes, yes. Okay, I different, I different number. I, uh, the record may be more accurate than my hearing. So uh, I just wanted to follow up on that. Uh, Dr. Soren, Sosen, so, so, pronounce it for me so I get it right. It's Sassen, sir. Sassen, thank you. I apologize. With my name, I should be more sensitive to everyone's name. Uh, doctor, uh, the... Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, realistically, historically, in a outbreak, once we get past the first responders, don't we always allocate our resources to less than the entire population, uh, including the plan you have for smallpox? And I guess I'm leading up to the point, we don't have enough smallpox vaccine to begin to do the entire population. That's not even in the plan, is it? Well, actually, stockpiled, we do have sufficient smallpox vaccine for the entire population. The challenges of administering that vaccine are, are really where the, the bottleneck and the, and the most difficult challenges will, will lie. Um, but your broader point, which is planning for catastrophic events. Okay, let's take anthrax, for example. How many, how many doses do you have today? in the stockpile? And more importantly, how many will you have five years from now with the current uh, no orders? Um, I'll have to get back to you on the specific numbers. We have both uh, antibiotic treatments for anthrax as well as vaccine for anthrax um, and, uh, and uh, a strategy for increasing vaccine as well as uh, um, development of a new generation vaccine uh, for anthrax. So there's a lot of work in progress and I will get you the specific numbers. But Sir, so let, let him finish his answer, if I'm you sorry, will. Yeah. Uh, the, the broader question you raise of, of planning for catastrophic events, um, which means the system fails, um, uh, inevitably uh, runs into limitations of resources and therefore prioritization and strategies to, uh, to do the best we can and address the, the, the best we can within the limitations of resources. Well, and back to the resources for just a second, Dr. Sosen. Since we spend about twice as much as the Europeans do on health care, I'm going to assume that money alone doesn't fix the problem based on how we spend money on health care in America, just the fact that we already spend more than the nations we're being compared to. Isn't the most important thing for us to have is a plan to ensure that our first responders, including all the health care professionals that will receive people, are able to be continuously inoculated, prepared, or if we don't have something, the first to receive. Isn't that sort of the, the crux to the most important crux of the plan is that we not lose those people which uh, Dr. Jarris and others have said are already in short supply? Clearly, there are a number of priorities for how we respond most effectively, and first-line responders are one of those priority groups, whether that's in the health care system uh, whether that's an emergency response and er emergency management system. I think the comments made earlier about vulnerable populations, however, reflect also government responsibility to assure that those with the least access and the, and the greatest need are also uh, that there's a safety net for them. So planning really has to be broad in, in, in the broadest sense. Um, but there are strategic uh, um, priorities set for early stages versus later stages of response. Okay, and uh, one follow-up to something I said in my opening comment. Uh, since the anthrax stockpile is expiring and it has never been offered broadly uh, to first responders, do you have a plan to deal with making that available to first responders around the country, including our health care professionals, rather than destroy the stockpile, which is currently in the plan? 
There is ongoing uh, discussions uh, amongst the emergency responder community with the Department of Homeland Security, Department of Health and Human Services about um, the appropriateness, suitability of this vaccine in that setting. There have been advisory committees for immunization practices looking at and providing permissive guidance that uh, without sufficient understanding of risk um, that there may be a point in time when risk is sufficient to, to warrant pre-vaccination of those populations. So there's discussion about that. There is the ability to make that vaccine available before it expires, um, but that's active discussions going on right now. Well, let me just ask one final follow-up question, Mr. Chairman, if I, if I may. You may. Aren't our health care professionals, um, specifically doctors and nurses at our community centers around the country, aren't they the most informed consent individuals? And if you have a distribution request and it's a voluntary taking by those individuals, remembering that our military, it's not voluntary. They get, you know, they get the shots whether they like it or not. They... They, you know, they go to combat, they're going to have it. Wouldn't that be a group that, by definition, the safeguards you're talking about, protecting them from not having enough informed consent, isn't this a group of people that we normally rely on to, ma to advise people? And therefore, if a doctor in Cle at the Cleveland Clinic uh, or Cairo Community uh, Hospital wants that medicine and believes the, the, uh, and, and has the normal or informed consent, aren't they by definition the people that should be allowed to make that decision, not have it micromanaged in Washington? Thank you, sir. Um, my You're understanding, most welcome. <laughs> my understanding is that the licensed vaccine is actually uh, potentially commercially available. The company has indicated that they have uh, capacity uh, to produce and sell the vaccine uh, ad additionally. These questions are really about the purchases that the federal government has made, and is there a strategy for making that uh, available uh, to populations in need? Um, I'm not aware that the medical, the health care community, in a similar way as uh, they were not terribly interested in smallpox vaccine, has not indicated an interest in anthrax vaccine um, at the same time. The emergency responder community um, we hear is mixed in, in terms of their perspective of whether that should be required um, or made available to them. And the Department of Homeland Security is establishing whether this is appropriate for their, uh, for their uh, approved uh, equipment list and, and therefore can be used, the funds could be used uh, from uh, Homeland Security to do it. So it's, there's complexity there, but your, your broader question of should the medical community be in a position to um, um, utilize a licensed product, absolutely. Um, that, that is the way our health system works. Mr. Chairman, that wasn't my question. The question is, before we throw this material away or actually right. spend money destroying it, will we make it avo available with ordinary, you know, if you will, informed consent so that it not be literally thrown away while the alternative to go by is what uh, the hospitals, including the first responders in Cleveland, who asked me about this when I was there? Right. And that's, that's an excellent question. Let me just say this before I yield to the gentleman from, from Rhode Island. You know, uh, you have a plan, but without the resources, you don't have a plan. You can't carry it out. And I think that, you know, you need to just be honest about it and just sort of point it out, and let's see if we can't get some help for you. Because uh, it doesn't make you a bad commissioner, a bad administrator, because you don't have the resources. I think you have to fight to get the resources, because this is serious. And uh, and if you have a plan, you can't implement it. It's no plan, Dr. Archer. And and one of those resources is the challenge and the failed challenge, I think, in this country in, in regards to vaccine production. We have problems with standard vaccines not always being there when we need to, and we have to change our message to the public. Um, there are ways to fix it if we actually sat down and talked about it. Uh, Having worked in Ford Motor Company, I could use an analogy. If we had to make cars and decide how many were made today, nine months ago, if you had to change the model every year, if you had to throw every car away that wasn't sold within three months, um, and if you had to share the keys with others because half the benefit of vaccines are not the individual but the herd immunity effect. If you looked at all those dynamics, um, no wonder we're having trouble producing vaccine at the level that we should be in this country, and we need to address that and fix that. Talking about who's going to be a priority, whether it's first responders or whatever, when the real problem is we haven't fixed a production issue 
of vaccines in this country so that we can get them to everybody. Yes, there are challenges with smallpox, there's challenges with anthrax, but that doesn't spread like wildfire or like influenza, so it's a little different animal. We really do need to be able to vaccinate every American to, for normal seasonal influenza. I agree. I agree with you. Mr. Chairman, may I yeah. um, comment that I think you are right, and, and the comments have been uh, made appropriately before. We can mount a response. We can't maintain it, so our plan is not adequate because the resources aren't there. And at the time we, we uh, testified before um, the committees a couple of weeks ago when we said we were requesting $350 million for state and local preparedness, that was a figure that's a very low figure. Uh, that figure would be equivalent to what we have gotten uh, we had two appropriations in the PACs out of the – excuse me, a single $600 million appropriation. We got a $250 million and $350 million uh, um, uh, monies to f support state and local preparedness. So, so all we asked for was basically another s sum of money to continue the level of planning and preparedness we did. Now, frankly, we made a mistake because that was before we knew how serious this was and how, how serious the fall may be. So the $350 million in the House uh, right now is probably not nearly enough, and it's a start to get us to revise our plans. We also asked um, for some money to, to purchase um, antivirals, and to get to Mr. Iz's point, for health care workers and, and critical responder, responders. Our strategic national stockpile right now only has countermeasures um, masks and antivirals for treatment. It does not have uh, antivirals and masks for prophylaxis for health care workers, public health workers, and ambulance. So we asked for money for that also. Um, so clearly we need more money. Um, as you say, it, it is not appropriate to put first responders, whether they're public health, fire, or ambulance squads, in harm's way without protecting them. And yet our current strategic national stockpile does not have antivirals for that prophylaxis. So we really do need more money, and I'm sorry we underasked. Right. Thank you very much. I, I yield to the gentleman from Rhode Island who had asked this question. He might want to rephrase it now. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I, I'd really like, uh, just as the chairman asked, to get some real numbers in terms of what would be ideal budgets. Um, I serve on the Appropriations Health and Human Services Committee for HHS. Um, we're going to be going into markup in the next couple of weeks. Um, this is frightening. Um, all I know is that I would be derelict in my job as a member of Congress, as a member of that committee, next fall if I'm sitting there in Congress and we have this flu and it's by all accounts this flu is coming back and this scenario that you're, you're painting for us is happening and I'm sitting there after having sat in this hearing and someone said, w weren't you in that hearing? Didn't you hear what they told you? And I did nothing about it. And uh, for one thing, we have been told there aren't going to be any more supplementals. So this, ha this has to be part of this year's budget. It's got to be part of this year's appropriations. So we had better get to it. And knowing the, you know, glazed over look in, you know, appropriators' eyes when you talk about more money for this and that, if, this, if something isn't burning up, you know, things aren't going to get funded. You've got to really... Um, as, as you all have said, seize the opportunity that we have right now in terms of the public's attention on this and really make the most of it because we're not going to have this opportunity uh, till next fall and then it's going to be too late. Uh, so we had better move now. Uh, and I just want to underscore your urgency about this and say don't hold back, okay? Um, and you're not stepping on anybody's toes, okay? You're, you're, you're going to be derelict in your own responsibilities to the administration which you work for and to your own obligation to public health if you don't make some really aggressive and ambitious, um, you know, budgets uh, and put them forward in spite of whatever your higher up say, because frankly, I'm going to demand it. I'm going to pu push for it, as I know the chairman will be, to get these answers. Um, the fact that you're, you can't even vaccinate one-third of your current population when you have a year to prepare for it 
terrifies me. And we have just a few months to prepare for the H1N1 this fall. And we can't even prepare to get a third of the yearly, which is only a million and change. And we're talking about 600 million doses? I mean, the, the scale of this thing is enormous. And I don't think we can, we've even wrapped our heads around how big a challenge this is. So we need to know the number, the ratio of public health personnel to the population that is needed. We need to know the ratio of, po of volunteers and, and you, know, you know, that we need backup personnel that we need versus population uh, that's going to be needed. Uh, we need to, to have the numbers of uh, prophylactic um, equipment and the like. All of those things need to be sized up. Um, and again, I'd ask you, what do we have in terms of plans for the faith community, for the private sector, for the public sector, and the like, that they can exercise? Are we using technology? Are we using, you know for the cell phones, for Twitter, for the e email, for what, I mean, what are we doing to be able to message people when it comes to this modern society to be able to communicate with them so they're not just getting uh, messages from, you know, these 24-hour uh, uh, news that often are inflammatory and, and are full of misrepresentations in terms of news. How do we get facts out there and real information in terms of what to do and where to go so people feel empowered and not fearful? That's the key is what I want to ask you guys. How do we make people feel empowered here? Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Getting to your, your first point about having confidence in your government, having confidence that you know what to do, and therefore responding more effectively, that's absolutely critical. The numbers that Dr. Jerish shared about this event, uh, where we uh, approached it very aggressively, we did use Twitter and widgets and other kinds of tools to reach the broadest population we could, distributed from the federal level, state and local levels, um, um, through practitioners as well as directly to the public. Um, communications just in time about what you can do um, and what you can expect and what we know and what we don't know has been one of the successes of our response so far. Maintaining the pace, um, addressing the complexity, uh, those will be challenges in a, in a larger scale event for, for sure. Um, so, so yes, we're responding to um, some of those communication challenges that empower um, the public, um, empower business, etc. cetera. Um, we've definitely come a long way with respect to engaging business, engaging the faith community, engaging the public, and we have a lot more work to do. I will point out that those plans that have been discussed here um, have been evaluated in quite a lot of detail. Twelve departments, two offices of the White House participated in a joint review of the pandemic influenza plans. And there's a, a volume of information on the pandemicflu.gov uh, website on those evaluations. Importantly, the kinds of activities that we've been talking about here that lie in the lane of public health were the strongest parts of those plans. The weakest parts of those plans were the broader interagency, intergovernmental coordination, interdisciplinary coordination with the emergency response community at large, with the service sectors, et cetera. So even the plans that we have reflect gaps and needs for more effort, not just sustainment of where we were six years ago. I'd just like to add that I agree completely. Public communication is critical. We can't respond to a pandemic in this country without people understanding what their role is, what they need to do, and we've invested a lot of effort in New York and I know in the other states in, in trying to do that. We've also worked with our business and faith communities. We've worked with businesses to develop continuity of operations plans so they can continue to operate in a pandemic, particularly if uh, you know people can, can work from home, that kind of thing. That doesn't always work, but uh, to try and think through um, and, and I, 
you know, in a normal flu season, we only vaccinate 100 million people because there's not a demand out there for it. I think we've gotten their attention, as others have said, uh, with this uh, H1N1, and that the challenge will be how to meet the demand that I suspect we will see if we did uh, really roll out a vaccine and try to offer to everybody. That, that will be the real challenge, and you're right. We need to have uh, the detailed plan of how many people we need to do that. We partly need to see when it's going to happen, how quickly it will roll out, will we really see 15 million doses a week coming out. Uh, there's, there's a lot of detail there to give you a precise answer, but we need a lot more than we have right now. Uh, Congressman Kennedy, I think, you know, the, the whole issue of this culture of preparedness, uh, getting folks to think about this. Red Cross has worked on this for some time. Uh, there's fatigue when people have a sense that nothing happens. They think that, you know, public health is chicken little. They're saying, you know, and, and I think from our end, this is a wake-up call, and we're hoping to now capitalize. CDC has some great educational information that talks about, you know, clean hands save lives. Just a basic message is critical, but, but there's lots of fear and there's a tremendous amount of rumors that occur in the middle of this that everyone here has dealt with that need to be dispelled as quick as possible. And that, that individual preparedness and, and planning uh, for families um, and understanding messaging are, are I think, essential. Uh, the, it's nice that there's now attention being paid to public health and, and, and an understanding of uh, the critical nature of what we do. So I'm glad that this discussion is, is being had. Congressman Kennedy, you're bringing up a, a very important point about communication and maintaining the credibility of government. And what we saw in 1918 because of a lack of transparency is people did f lose faith in the government. And we saw some of the social fabric in this country, neighbor caring for neighbor, breaking down. So that is something we very deliberately have to pursue. Um, one thing I'd ask you all to keep in mind is that we don't have a separate workforce in public health that we pull out of the closet for a pandemic or a hurricane. These are our everyday workforce. And that is why we need to have that bench strength and those professionals, those nurses, laboratorians, epidemiologists on board every day so we can surge with them. Part of that uh, um, system of public health that we so clearly need are experts in communication. And you mentioned you're on the HHS uh, uh, subcommittee. Uh, uh, very importantly, um, the communication was done so well because we had experts working on how to communicate with the public who were monitoring the Twitters, the blogs, the webs, the, the newspaper articles, the, the television media to see where the direction was. What are people thinking? What are they reporting on? So we could, on a daily basis, adjust our messaging. And on a daily basis, the CDC's director's talking points were sent to the state health officials, were sent to the local health officials who were on message. One of the reasons I bring that up is that that messaging is coordinated within the CDC and the National Center for Health Marketing, a terrible name and a very unfortunate name. But they are undergoing significant cuts in the budget. I believe it's $9 million in the 09 budget and $3 million in the 10, 2010 budget. It has a terrible name, marketing. We say, what is that doing in public health? But what they are doing is understanding how to communicate expertly with the public, and much of our success was due to that center's work. So I'd ask you to take a hard look at that, and maybe they can change their name. Thank you. We will get back to you with the challenge you put out to us on the ratios in regards to public health folks and volunteers, et cetera, and I think that's critical. I mean, to give you an example, we have a full-time public information officer that's paid out of this, the CDC funds for preparedness. That person doesn't just serve our Kansas City, but serves uh, the whole region uh, in regards to preparedness. Now, they carry a 24-7 media pager. They'll respond 90 percent of the time within five minutes. If we don't get a call from the media in two days, we check the battery or try to figure out what's going on because they're constantly having interaction with the media. That allows us to change that message. When the message is wrong at the 6 o'clock news, we can usually get it changed by the 10 o'clock news because we have the interactions with the media. That's not present in all of our communities, and we need that support. But that person uh, burned out in this event, and we had to send them home uh, just to get some rest. Well, I hate to bring up burned out, but National Guard is already burned out. But I imagine you mentioned national security when you mentioned this. Yeah. I imagine national security would be invoked 
in favor of bringing in National Guard to help you in some way. Maybe you could give us a response at some later date about what you think of employing National Guard, proper training included. We well. have the Medical Reserve Corps, but that's done on a shoestring. Uh, we really need some of those protections that the National Guard had in regards to actually paying people for training and those things, and that we could create a model that would really work, and we'd love to work with you on that. Right. Let me think. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, let me recognize the Women's Caucus, and we have a lot of health care people involved, and uh, we just want to thank you very much for uh, your attendance. Thank you very much, the Women's Caucus. Uh, at this time, I yield to Congressman Bill Bray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, coming from Southern California, uh, burned out is, takes on a different concept, especially after the couple of years we've had. Um, what's the population of Vermont? It's about uh, 620,000 uh, people, wow. not including the cows. Okay. Um, I supervise the disaster preparedness system and the health care system for the county of San Diego, uh, which is $3 million. Uh, I assume your disaster preparedness structure is probably statewide and not regional, or do you, do you – well, I'm no longer with the state of Vermont, but yes, uh, Vermont had a, a single structure. For single the state. structure, I figure that size. Um, and Mr. Archer, you pointed out on this, and this is where how this all works in the network of how well integrated are you're all integrated into the disaster preparedness structure, right? Yes. The, um, <laughs> doctor, if you were going to be somebody who wanted to plant a virus. In 500 people, that would have the most impact on this country. If you were going to plant, figure out a profession, 500 people, maybe two or three professions, have you guys looked at exactly who's got what group of people have the potential to spread the problem fastest and, and uh, easiest? Sir, so with respect to uh, terrorism, um, and biological terrorism, um, there is an intergovernmental process of establishing uh, risk um, and uh, conducting a risk assessment that includes uh, understanding of uh, impact, of uh, capabilities of those who might uh, attempt to, to do such things. Um, that, that isn't what I'm here prepared to speak about okay. today, um, but I will like, acknowledge that nature as a terrorist here with influenza, it's about the best reassortment of virus uh, reassorting virus to be able to pick up antiviral resistance and modify um, during the course of a season that uh, that you could uh, you could ever devise uh, in, in in a laboratory. Um, so we're up against something that is uh, that is really quite uh, uh, daunting. I'm just thinking about what we can do as an oversight committee, rather than just complain about what the executive branch is not doing enough of. Um, what we can do to be proactive on this. And it became obvious to me, as somebody who worked with public health, that, that last October, that if there was ever 500 people who could come in close proximity to a lot of people all over this country, um, that all meet at one location and go out into the country, would be the members of Congress. I mean, you talk about, you know, the vectors, you know, you know paid for with taxpayers' money. Get out there and kiss as many babies as you can, shake as many hands as you can. Uh, and frankly, Mr. Chairman, this is one of the concerns I have where there was a lot of discussion about members of Congress getting inoculation. Frankly, I think it should be a requirement that the senators and, and House members are required to be inoculated. I, I just said, unless there's a medical reason for them not to be, with how much exposure um, we constitute to the, the general public, that's one of those things. The other group that's probably, probably the only group that's probably more than your duly elected representatives of the House and Senate would be flight attendants and pilots. I don't know. There may be other professions. But, boy, I'll tell you, I think history has proven the flight attendant uh, potential for spreading uh, disease. But I think that we need to talk about this in frank and open ways, back and forth, of what aren't we doing, are we requiring are those involved with um, commercial aviation to be inoculated? And are we talking about ourselves, making sure that we're not part of the problem? Uh, 
but I want you to know, I, I, I listened to the Vice President. I did not fly last week. Um, I was very concerned about that and made sure that I stayed put until, uh, well, let's just go on. Notifying the public. There was uh, Mr. Kennedy raised this issue. What is the potential in your city, I mean, in, in um, St. Louis? You have reverse 911 now? City, I mean, Kansas City, Missouri. Kansas City, I'm sorry. Um, we do not have reverse 911. Um, we, though, have tremendous cooperation with all of our TV stations, so as long as they have power and can broadcast, uh, we have that mechanism to get information out. When you were at Vermont, did they have reverse 911? Anybody? Uh, the city of Cleveland has a warrant system within the city boundaries in some select uh, more uh, um, financially well-off uh, suburbs have some capacity, but it's not uniform outside of the city. But That's the city has the ability to call people's homes with a message telling them immediate being yes. able to call into them. They, they just, with a message, it's a one-way type, right. Okay. Just explain it, because we developed that because of our fires. We can actually tell street by street, neighborhood by neighborhood, uh, what the conditions were, be informed. And I, I'm, I, I'm sorry that Mr. Kennedy isn't here, because there is a place of being able to empower and the locals being able to be that bridge. Um, uh, doctor, when we're talking about, you know, I'll, I'll, let me throw this out. There's a very real possibility with this new strain that we will not see the drop off during the summer. Have anybody even discussed that, that this, this may, we may have this right through the summer? There is uh, a lot of attention to the virus um, domestically as well as abroad, and in particular in the southern hemisphere, which is entering its typical uh, seasonal influenza season. So um, that we're not standing down, and I don't believe any of the folks at this table are, are, are really uh, re returning to business as usual. Um, we don't typically see um, much virus activity, but as Dr. Jarris pointed out, uh, this hasn't been a typical virus. So we are, are watching very carefully. This is still very early on in, the, uh, in this outbreak, and, and it, it, anything is possible with this virus. Mr. Chairman, there's one last question. We're, we're talking about what we can do. If you had FDA approve a post-exposure treatment, that was genetically engineered to address 11 out of 16 different strains. If you had the ability to have an effective post-exposure treatment or, also, or had a vaccine that was multi-strain in itself, if you had that lined up and ready in time for the next cycle, wouldn't that be a major plus for you to be able to uh, start tooling up. And this gets down to your issue of us changing our operations and getting the stuff available. Uh, just comments on that. Well, I think we're not talking about post-exposure, but the vaccine that we're talking about would be exactly what you're saying. And, and uh, that's, yes, that's what we need. Uh, okay. I just want you guys to keep raising the issue that we've got to also be putting pressure on FDA. That we're, when we talk about crisis along, they need to change our procedures and we need to change our procedures to make sure that we don't, like the uh, British when they're fighting the Zulus, have everybody lined up in straight little rows while they're being wiped out because the regulations say that's what you have to do to get ammo rather than get, change our procedures to make sure you have the assets um, that could be available to you not just because of monetary, but because of regulatory obstructions. Doctor, you want to comment on it? Yes, I think there's a, a very good example of where we could use assistance in this regard. Um, there is a shelf life extension program currently that the D Department of Defense, VA, the SNS, um, and I think those are the organizations that use. And in that program, the Tamiflu has been extended now for up to 10 years, the shelf life. The Tamiflu in the state stockpiles it has not been it has not is not under a shelf life extension program we worked very hard with the fda and uh, the manufacturers so that it went from five years to seven this years that saved us 200 million dollars in the states but we if we could develop a shelf life extension program so that we aren't discarding hundreds of millions of dollars worth of antivirals, that would be extremely valuable, minimal cost for a huge savings. And that is clearly an intergovernmental affair. 
Gentleman's time is. I'm sorry. I just allow you to answer. Want to ahead, correct uh, one issue? Yes. The, the issue with Tamiflu is the manufacturer went to FDA and said, "Look, our product actually can last seven years, not five years, um, allowing for a process of relabeling and extending the ex expiration date." Um, so that process actually is available to states who have received Tamiflu from the federal supply to, to relabel. There's a process that has to be gone through. I, I, but the shelf life extension program is, is, a, is a broader issue about all expiring uh, products. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just think we need to be more proactive at looking at this and we have as much passion about changing our regulations to make the resources as we are about top, spending money and throwing money at the problem. And here's one of those items that Mr. Issa was pointing out. Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. The Congressman from Texas, Congressman Quayla. Chairman, thank you very much for having this meeting. I want to thank the witnesses for being here. I uh, chair the subcommittee on uh, response and preparedness of the uh, Homeland Security Committee, so I value what you all have been saying. I appreciate it. I'll start off with my first question to Dr. Sossin, and, and, and again, thank you for the work that you doing there at CDC. Uh, my uh, question refers to the time that you were de dealing with biosurveillance. Um, I'm from Texas, uh, Laredo, right at the border of uh, the U.S.-Mexico border. As you know, we've been hit uh, pretty hard by the H1N1 uh, uh, cases that we've had. Uh, I know that disease uh, surveillance uh, information is critical for those in leadership positions to make the best decisions regarding resource, uh, resource allocation, school closures, you know, those type of uh, decisions. Uh, can you tell me uh, how the information being put out by CDC through its various biosurveillance efforts, it's helping the states, the territories, tribes, localities to make those decisions, uh, number one? And then number two, what sorts of lessons have we learned so far from the H1N1 uh, situation, and how do you see those being incorporated into the current system so that we're better prepared as a nation if the disease gets worse, particularly this coming winter? Thank you, sir. Um, one thing I'd like to start off by acknowledging is that uh, as surveillance and biosurveillance uh, begins at the local and state level, um, and what we are able to provide back to uh, state and locals to help inform them is the broader, bigger national picture that crosses the jurisdictional boundaries. Um, so it's a partnership uh, from, from the ground up. Um, Biosurveillance, some of the efforts to, uh, to um, get earlier cues of events that might be happening, uh, detect them and respond to them more quickly, um, that narrower piece really had a relatively small role to play in the early uh, development of this, this outbreak because it was laboratory detected very early on and a major focus at the public health level to go out and investigate laboratory confirmed cases and better understand this, this outbreak. As the outbreak spread, our ability to understand what is going on broadly in communities where the laboratory was only one small piece of the broader out outbreak, that information is becoming more valuable. Um, certainly, the, the probably the most useful uh, piece of, of focus that we've we've made in biosurveillance um, in in the past few years is is how we integrate information from multiple different types of information streams, um, and then present that to decision makers on a daily basis in briefings, in in slide sets, and whatever else that we share broadly, um, and and we have had uh, some success there as well. So I think the 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 feedback on biosurveillance efforts. Um, is is uh, is too too early in this outbreak to tell you entirely, and I think the focus on biosurveillance as syndromic influenza-like illness is too narrow. Um, so the 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 focus on excuse me the focus on health information technology and electronic laboratory information, death certificate information, and hospital or, or medical information is a, is a place where at the state, local, and federal level uh, we we need to continue to advance those developments. How are we doing on the uh, transition, doctor, from um, developing vaccines and eggs, as you know, they're developing eggs to a cell-based uh, solution? Where are we in that? We need a lot of eggs to develop vaccines, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it is a, a process of development. There are uh, new platforms for vaccine development that they are pretty early. Um, they're not replacing egg development at this point in time, and I can't give you particulars as it relates to the H1N1 vaccine development, how much would be egg and how much um, in, in cellular techniques. Okay. Um, if that's something you would like more information on, we can, we can provide yeah, that to you. Yeah, I'd like to get that. And, and real quick, because I don't have time, just a quick question to one of the other four gentlemen. Um, 
yeah, again, understanding the, the strains, and I think you all articulated that pretty well, uh, how much more do you think public health departments can handle right now with the H1N1 outbreaks occurring? I mean, you got those strains, and, and I guess whoever provided one of the uh, – um, there was a um, – um, a, a, a pictorial uh, gram here about how much I guess this is pretty much what we're looking at wherever we've got that at we're down here this current situation and I guess to get up here it's going to take a lot of effort so I assume there's a lot of uh, strain on what you're all doing I think that's the message that we're getting loud and clear Mr. Do uh, Dr. Burkhead or anybody wants to answer no that's right I think uh, public health departments across the country at the state and local level have been operating uh, you know, 24, almost 24-7 now for the last month. It's, it's eased up a little bit, but it's not going away. And we need to sort of uh, arrive at a new normal for going forward. But as, if this gears up at all in the fall and we're having to do vaccination at the same time, it's, it's uh, not going to be sustainable without right. more resources. Well, I think the chairman was correct. I think we're trying to get some input from you all. And we might not grant all the wishes, but... Uh, we certainly want to know what you think we ought to be addressing. Thank you to all of you. I appreciate your time and effort for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, and thank you, gentlemen, for um, his questions. Uh, Congressman Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Allen, does Cuyahoga County currently have the ability to handle a pandemic? Do we have the health infrastructure to do that? I think that... Uh, Congressman Kucinich, that uh, Cuyahoga County has a, a wealth of certainly health care capacity. I think that in an H1N1 response, it's important to, to, to note that the uh, current um, activity relative to this virus is sort of uneven around the country right now. Certainly in New York, there's a lot of activity, as Dr. Burke had pointed out, and we've been reading in the newspapers. Uh, I think if we start to move forward on a pandemic of higher severity, we're going to be stressing the system. The current level of severity that we're dealing with with sporadic activity in Ohio and, and in, the, in the greater Cleveland area is, is something that we think we can maintain activity on uh, in terms of control. You're saying we have the health infrastructure to maintain public health support for a pandemic? I'm saying that in terms of the, a pandemic of this low severity that we're seeing, we, we can deal with it locally. If it begins but to get, become more severe, we're going to have some serious problems. You've, well, you've said in your testimony that mm -hmm. uh, not knowing if the virus will shift or drift, right. you're looking into the fall of 2009 and beyond, mm -hmm. uh, you're, you have a to-do list. Right. Now, your to-do list notes that if funding levels continue to drop as anticipated, we'll be unable to advance our detection, preparedness, and response. Now, detection is an essential part of being able mm -hmm. to get ahead of a pandemic, right? Right. How much – can you put a dollar figure on what Cuyahoga County needs in order to adequately uh, advance detection preparedness and response capacity to a level that would be necessary if a more severe virus were to emerge? Mm -hmm. Well, we were – uh, back in 2005, somewhere around 2.2 to 2.5 million in terms of our funding level for the county, and that involved both the city and the county. That allowed us to advance our plans, uh, I, think, uh, I think, substantially. We've seen cuts, which means now we're losing people, which means the to-do list is still sitting there. In fact, as people step away, the to-do to -do list may get longer uh, for us to, to accomplish. So. Uh, from our end, we think a relatively modest investment nationally in public health relative to other um, national issues can go a long way. If we look at a situation where we're going to be having to vaccinate folks to a new virus, also dealing with seasonal flu vaccination, dealing with a potential escalation of severity in the fall, that confluence of things right now we're not prepared to address. And, and what about uh, would you, if there was an, an increase in, the, in incidence uh, would you have the infrastructure at this moment to be able to uh, keep up with testing suspected carriers of, of a virus? Well, that testing in Ohio specifically ties back into some um, rapid detection work that's being done in, in the hospitals, and then the activity all flows through the state health department. So it's a question of capacity of the state health department, which if we saw a significant increase, 
Um, I, I know that there was some there was uh, some early delays as, as people were dealing with the volume, but it's a question of state level capacity. We have one lab in Ohio, and it all goes through Columbus. One lab, one lab to handle this this uh, it's incident. Yes. And and do you have direct contact with the CDC? We uh, our contact occurs through the state health department. And the I think, Mr. Chairman, it would be. Um, interesting to canvas the state health departments to see about their contact with the CDC because if something's getting out of control in an area, uh, in a county as large as Cuyahoga, it seems to me that the large counties, which in some cases are bigger than some states, should have a, uh, a, a quicker connection to the CDC since we're talking about the fact that a virus can, uh, the um, uh, the very nature of a virus, it, it can spread in any direction at any time. Did you want to say something, Dr. Burkhead? Yeah, let me just comment from New York State and New York City's point of view. We do have direct access to the scientists at CDC and uh, have had it with the school situations going on and uh, now with looking also at uh, more hospitalized cases, we've been able to have conference calls directly with the folks at CDC. You know, Mr. Chairman, I think, uh, I think one of the things that we might want to do is to ask the CDC about these large metropolitan areas, instead of going through uh, states, large metropolitan areas should have the ability to contact the CDC directly. Uh, I, I, my time has run out, but I want to thank uh, Mr. Allen for his service, and I look forward to working with you and making sure that uh, Cuyahoga County will have the ability to be able to respond appropriately to any uh, uh, threat of a pandemic. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for holding this hearing along with the ranking member. I want to thank the witnesses for their willingness to help the committee with its work. Uh, Dr. Sawson, uh, thank you for your service to our country. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, we had a hearing here last week uh, centrally dealing with the vulnerability of some of our federal employees. I happen to chair that, that subcommittee. And uh, right now, uh, we have a situation where we've got a lot of our folks on the borders, uh, you know, Customs and Border Patrol folks, ICE, uh, Transportation Security Officers, uh, and they are on our country's borders and as well at uh, major ports of entry. And uh, I would say on average uh, many of these officers uh, probably screen, they come in direct physical contact with uh, some of them, 3,000 passengers are, are travelers per shift. Uh, up until recently, even through this, uh, this uh, crisis, H1N1 uh, pandemic, they were instructed by their supervisors at the Department of Homeland Security and other agencies that they were not to wear uh, masks. They basically had these masks. They're not very threatening, but apparently uh, the Department of Homeland Security felt that, they, that the public might be overly alarmed if, if the Border Patrol officers and, and travel, uh, transit security officers wore something like this. Uh, that's an N95, just for the record. Uh, they were told, as a matter of fact, to take off these masks when a few of them took the initiative to protect themselves. And this is where the CDC comes in. The Department of Homeland Security said they were relying on a determination by CDC that uh, masks like this and gloves and Purell, uh, you know, repeated applications of Purell were medically unnecessary for our, our border security folks and uh, transportation security officers. Even though they're in physical contact, they're wanding, checking passports and coming in physical contact on a regular basis with these folks. Uh, and again, they use the term medically unnecessary. Now, meanwhile, we got other instructions from CDC saying folks should cover their mouths, wash their hands, uh, and, and avoid unnecessary travel to Mexico. So now I've got hundreds of, actually thousands of uh, border folks, uh, security officers at the Laredo uh, facility is, is part of this, uh, the busiest uh, checkpoint uh, in our country. And even though we've got that, that concern out there, uh, 
And, and the, meanwhile, the, our people, the U.S. Transit Security Officers and Border Patrol people are looking across at the Laredo checkpoint, and the Mexican folks on the other side, the Mexican security officers, all have these masks on. But, but we're being told it's medically unnecessary. Uh, and meanwhile, the World Health Organization has already taken it to a five, which means a global pandemic is imminent. Uh, I, I just find it mystifying why we have the World Health Organization saying we're at level five going to level six on a global pandemic. We got schools shutting down all over the place. And in the meantime, you've got these officers who are actually screening 3,000 passengers a day, 3,000 travelers a day. Uh, you know, the epicenter of this thing was in Mexico City. The, the, you know, infection counts in Texas, California, and Arizona are off the charts. They're, they're something like, you know, 400 percent of the national average. And we're not letting our folks wear these masks because it might alarm the public. And I'm just wondering, uh, where is the sense of, of that policy? Thank you, sir. Um, this is uh, challenging uh, decision-making. Um, it's not strictly a science-based decision. Apparently. Um, the specifics of, uh, of the Department of Homeland Security's decisions, um, the interactions with CDC, um, are uh, ongoing and and evolving, um, so so that's that's one piece. Um, the the challenge here is establishing level of risk uh, versus level of response that's feasible and appropriate. Um, whether it's ever appropriate to forbid people to uh, to use protective equipment or not is is an issue. I don't want to I don't want to touch on, but whether it should be required or recommended. Um, is, is the challenge that CDC has been, uh, has been trying to produce in its guidance. Let me say that, uh, that the, the crux of the CDC position, um, as uh, reflected in the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, which is a part of CDC, um, is that when in doubt, we offer guidance which protects the worker. Um, when in doubt, whether influenza can spread through airborne mechanism um, and we have a severe situation, um, we err on the side of, of protecting the worker. The challenge here, the WHO phases are not severity-based, and the challenge in this entire outbreak has been, is this more severe than what we see in seasonal flu, and therefore should we take more extreme measures than we typically take in seasonal flu? As you know, the Border, border Patrol does not, or, or border agents do not wear masks during flu season. Um, and so that question of are they at risk of more severe illness than they would be um, under circumstances comparable has been the challenging, most challenging part of this. We continue to watch for evidence of severity, for evidence of uniqueness, and needs for protection, um, and to offer uh, uh, guidance which is at minimum permissive of, of that type of protection, um, and when appropriate, uh, when, when felt to be appropriate, uh, specific guidance to, to use. And uh, all I can say is that, that this is a, continues to be a, a discussion. I, I know over the last two days, decision briefs about healthcare workers, which is another workforce of, of great concern, um, and the use of respirators like those N95s is, is continues to be uh, worked through so that we have practical, feasible, manageable uh, guidance, which also protects the worker. Okay, I appreciate your, your, your attempt to answer that question. I really do, and I don't want to, it's not your decision, so I'm not laying it on you. Mr. Chairman, could I ask Mr. Uh, Jaris to, to have a crack at that? Uh, we got this, it, it seems that, okay, I got a level five pandemic, which according to the World Health Organization says phase five is a strong signal that a pandemic is imminent and that the time to finalize the organization communication and implementation of planned mitigation measures is very short. Okay, so I've got the World Health Organization telling me this. You've got people sick all over the place. And the, the very people, you know, I would hate to be the 3,000th person that this guy, you know, this security officer, uh, you know, frisks and wands because he's likely to, to be contaminated at this point. And, and you know, he's, he's contaminating all the way down the line. So it, it, this, is, this is government bureaucracy at its worst, and, I, and, and I just, we just need to move the ball forward here and, and inject a little bit of common sense into the situation. Yeah, Congressman, I think that your question is, is a, a very valid one, and it's an example of 
the types of things we've been wrestling with for the last three weeks and why we haven't gotten sleep in the last three weeks. There are many, many examples of issues like this where we, as Dr. Sassen said, we don't, because this started in North America, we didn't have the two months to figure out how this transmitted from one person to another. Was it aerosol? Was it droplet? We didn't simply know that. Uh, we didn't know how transmissible it was. Was a border guard at risk or not at risk? What did it take to, to actually transmit this? We didn't know that. How severe it was, it didn't, I mean, initially, given what was going on in Mexico, we were very concerned. It looked as if it wasn't that severe, but we still don't quite know that. So we were in a situation of trying to make decisions in the face of tremendous uncertainty, always balancing what is the prudent thing to do against what is the disruption to society. Um, yeah. Um, with regard now, we were uh, two weeks ago. I was in a committee in which we were uh, being encouraged to close the border. Now, in retrospect, I think we would have said that probably wasn't the right thing to do. Right. But there certainly were people feeling strongly that, well, why wouldn't we do that? So, this is what we're struggling with, and and this is a, an indication of why we now need to go back. Given we've had these plans which have been obviously imperfect, and we can give you many other examples of imperfect uh, situations, and dedicate the time and the resources this summer to figure out what are we going to do in the fall if this comes back bigger? What are we going to do in the fall if this comes back more serious? And we need to be prepared. We right. need to address some of the issues of how do we um, look at CDC guidance, OSHA guidance, and NIOSH guidance, and which one actually applies in a given situation, because they may be different. Right. So... I appreciate your, your remarks, and, and, and I appreciate uh, the perspective that you, you provide. Uh, and, and you do say properly, I think, we've got to figure this out by, by the fall. And, you know, every, I think everybody on the panel has said, you know, we could have a tough, tough situation in the fall. Meanwhile, our Border Patrol people, transit security officers, cannot use masks. Seems rather silly to me, uh, but, you know. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Mr. Chairman, I have, I have abused my time, and I want to yield at this point, and thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, let me thank all of you for your testimony. You know, I appreciate your thoughts and insight, and I appreciate the interest of all the members who attended the hearing today. Before we adjourn, I would like to emphasize the continuing need for attention to be given to the issue of state and local pandemic readiness. As we have seen in recent weeks, an outbreak can strike at any time and potentially take a heavy toll. We must be prepared in order to protect the lives of our citizens. We don't wait for a house fire before we make sure that our fire department have fire engines and water hoses. Likewise, we cannot wait for a pandemic before we make sure our public health department have trained responders and a mechanism in place to provide vaccine, vaccines and treatments. The question becomes, what are the next steps? The House passed a funding for state and local pan, pandemic preparedness in the FY 2009 Supplemental Appropriation Act just last week. And Congresswoman Tammy Baldwin has recently introduced a bill, H.R. 805, of which I am a proud co-sponsor. This bill, the strengthening of America's public health system, would provide federal support for improving public health agencies, infectious disease and surveillance and reporting. What kind of sustained support can the federal government provide, given today's harsh economic circumstances, and how can states localities, the federal government, and other entities leverage the resources that we already have in order to increase our public health response capabilities. Please, please, let the record demonstrate my submission of a binder with documents relating to this hearing. Without objections, I enter this binder into the committee record, and without objections, the committee stands Where's my gavel? <laughs> Adjourned. And I leave the record open for five days for any additional comments.